Dear subscribers, after a long journey of creation and participation, it pains me to announce that my channel will be closing soon due to copyright issues. It has been a wonderful ride, and I am grateful for all your support and encouragement over the months. I hope you will continue to follow me on my second channel, where I will continue to share new and exciting content. Thank you for everything, Mr. Bell. You can find my new channel in the video description, YouTube forum, and in the comment section below. I look forward to seeing you on my new channel and thank you again for your support. Best wishes for your new project. My name is Ricardo Hernandez, and I am 32 years old. And this happened to me in 1994. I was born and raised in a small town in the Midwest where everybody knew each other. I worked as a mechanic, fixing up old cars and motorcycles. I wasn't much into the supernatural or ghost stories, but this one experience changed how I saw the world. It was early September and the leaves were just starting to turn. My friend Roy had a cabin up in the woods, about an hour's drive from town. He called me up and asked if I could help him fix his generator. It wasn't anything unusual. Roy was always tinkering with something or another. I agreed and drove up there on a Friday afternoon. The drive was pleasant, the kind where you roll down the windows and let the crisp air fill the car. The cabin was in a remote area surrounded by dense forest. When I arrived, Roy was outside chopping wood. Hey, Jax, he called, waving the axe in the air. Glad you could make it. Wouldn't miss it, I replied. Got the generator ready for me? He nodded and led me around back. The cabin was small, rustic, but comfortable. Roy had a habit of collecting old junk and his place was filled with it. I got to work on the generator, which was making a strange clunking noise. As I worked, Roy talked about a local legend. He called it the Forest Man, a creature that supposedly lived in the woods and was responsible for several disappearances over the years. I chuckled, shaking my head. Come on, Roy. You don't really believe in that stuff, do you? He shrugged. Not really, but some of the old timers swear by it. Weird things do happen out here. We spent the rest of the afternoon fixing the generator and catching up. By the time we were done, it was getting dark. Roy invited me to stay the night, and I accepted. We settled into the cabin with a couple of beers and some stories from our younger days. Around midnight, we heard a noise outside. It sounded like branches snapping. Roy got up to check, and I followed him to the window. We couldn't see much in the dark, just the faint outline of the trees against the night sky. Probably just a deer, Roy said, though he didn't sound convinced. We went back to our beers, but the noise persisted. It was getting closer, and now it sounded more like footsteps. Heavy, deliberate footsteps. Okay, that's not a deer, I said, grabbing a flashlight. Let's check it out. Roy grabbed his shotgun and we stepped outside. The air was cool and still the kind of quiet that makes every sound seem louder. I shone the flashlight around, but couldn't see anything unusual. Then we heard it again, coming from the direction of the woods. Stay close, Roy whispered as we moved toward the sound. We walked for a few minutes, the flashlight beam cutting through the darkness. Suddenly we saw something. It was tall, humanoid, but not quite right. Its limbs were too long, its posture hunched, the creature's eyes glowed faintly in the light. Jesus, what is that? I muttered. He raised the shotgun and fired. The sound echoed through the forest, and the creature let out a horrible, inhuman scream. It turned and fled into the woods, moving with an unnatural speed. Did you hit it? I asked, my heart pounding. I don't know, Roy replied, his voice shaky. But whatever it is, it's not happy. We decided it was best to head back to the cabin. Once inside, we locked the doors and windows, and Roy kept the shotgun close. Neither of us slept much that night. Every creak and rustle outside made us jump. The next morning, we went out to inspect the area. There were large, deep footprints leading into the woods, but they didn't look like any animal tracks I'd ever seen. Roy wanted to follow them, but I convinced him it was a bad idea. We didn't know what we were dealing with. Maybe we should report this, I suggested. Get the authorities involved. Roy shook his head. And tell them what? That we saw a monster in the woods? They'd think we were crazy. Reluctantly, I agreed. We spent the rest of the day repairing the cabin and trying to forget about what we saw. But that night, the noises started again. 
This time they were louder, more insistent. It felt like whatever was out there was trying to get in. Enough is enough. Roy said, grabbing the shotgun, I'm going to end this. I tried to talk him out of it, but he was determined. We stepped outside and the noises stopped abruptly. It was eerily silent, as if the forest itself was holding its breath. We walked to the edge of the woods and suddenly the creature appeared again. It was closer this time, and we could see it more clearly. Its skin was pale and stretched tight over its bones. Its eyes were dark, hollow pits. It had no nose, just two slits where nostrils should be. Roy raised the shotgun, but the creature moved faster than I thought possible. It knocked the gun from his hands and grabbed him, dragging him into the woods. I shouted and ran after them, but it was too fast. Within seconds, they were gone. Panic set in. I had no idea what to do. I couldn't leave Roy, but I also didn't want to end up like him. I ran back to the cabin, locked the doors, and tried to think. Hours passed, and there was no sign of Roy or the creature. The next morning, I decided to head back to town for help. I drove as fast as I could and went straight to the sheriff's office. Sheriff Wilson was an old friend of my dad's, and he listened patiently as I recounted the events. Jax, you're telling me a tall tale, he said, shaking his head. But I'll send a couple of deputies out to check the place. I waited anxiously at the station while they went up to the cabin. Hours later, they returned with grim faces. They found the cabin empty, the door ajar, and Roy's shotgun on the ground. There were signs of a struggle, but no blood. Whatever happened up there, we'll get to the bottom of it, Sheriff Wilson assured me. But I could tell he didn't believe my story. Days turned into weeks, and there was no sign of Roy. The official report listed him as a missing person, presumed dead. People in town started whispering, saying I had something to do with his disappearance. It didn't help that I couldn't give a clear description of the creature. I tried to move on with my life, but the experience haunted me. I started having nightmares about the creature, its hollow eyes staring into my soul. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was still out there watching, waiting. Then, a few months later, I heard about another disappearance. A hiker went missing in the same woods near Roy's cabin. The search parties found nothing but tracks similar to the ones we saw. It seemed the creature had claimed another victim. I decided to go back to the cabin one last time. I needed closure, and I hoped to find some clue that might explain what happened. I made my way back to the woods. The cabin looked the same, untouched since that night. I followed the tracks into the woods, retracing the steps Roy and I took. As I ventured deeper, I felt a growing sense of dread. The trees seemed to close in around me, and the air grew colder. Suddenly I saw it again. The creature stood at the edge of a clearing, watching me with those hollow eyes. It didn't move, just stared. I raised the rifle, but my hands were shaking so badly I could barely aim. What are you? I shouted, my voice echoing through the forest. The creature didn't respond. Instead, it stepped forward slowly, deliberately. I fired a shot, and it hit the ground near its feet. The creature flinched, but didn't retreat. It kept coming, and I fired again, this time hitting it in the shoulder. It let out that same horrible scream and lunged at me. I turned and ran, adrenaline fueling my escape. I didn't stop until I reached the cabin. I slammed the door shut and locked it, my heart pounding in my chest. The creature didn't follow. It seemed content to let me go for now. I left the cabin the next morning and never went back. The nightmares continued, and I couldn't shake the feeling that it was only a matter of time before the creature came for me. I moved to a different town, started a new life. The fear never left. Years later, I heard about another disappearance in those woods. This time it was a group of campers. They found the campsite abandoned, the tents ripped apart, the tracks were the same, and the whispers of the forest man resurfaced. I'm telling you this story not because I want sympathy or attention, but because I want to warn you. There are things in this world we don't understand. Things that defy explanation. Roy's gone, and so are those other people. I don't know what the creature is or where it came from, but I know it's still out there. If you ever find yourself in those woods, be careful. Don't go looking for trouble. And don't ignore the signs because once it finds you, there's no escaping it. I learned that the hard way, and I wouldn't wish that nightmare on anyone. 
The legend of the forest man might sound like a campfire story, but I assure you it's real. This happened to me in the spring of 99, a time when grunge was king and flannel was a fashion statement, not just something your grandpa wore. I was a young buck then, fresh out of college, and the world was my oyster, or so I thought. I was working as a freelance journalist, chasing stories like a dog after a bone. The pay was lousy, the hours were long, but damn it, I loved it. The thrill of the hunt, the adrenaline rush of a deadline, it was all intoxicating. One day, my editor tossed me a bone. Not just any bone, mind you, but a juicy one. A story about a string of missing persons in the Appalachian Mountains. All hikers, all vanished without a trace. Go get me the scoop, kid, he said, his eyes twinkling with a mix of amusement and challenge. So I packed my bags, grabbed my trusty old Nikon, and headed for the hills. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. The Appalachians are a different world a place where time seems to slow down, and the modern world fades away. It's a land of ancient forests, winding trails, and hidden hollows. It's beautiful, yes, but also wild and untamed. I spent days hiking those trails, talking to locals, following any lead I could find. The locals were a tight-lipped bunch, suspicious of outsiders, but they shared a few whispers, tales of strange lights in the woods, of eerie sounds in the night. They spoke of the Mountain Men, a group of recluses who lived deep in the wilderness, shunning society. One night I was camping by a creek, the fire crackling softly, the stars twinkling above. I was just about to doze off when I heard a sound, a twig snapping, a rustle of leaves, then a scream, a blood-curdling scream that echoed through the woods. I grabbed my flashlight and camera, my heart pounding in my chest. I followed the sound, my footsteps muffled by the soft earth, where a horrifying scene unfolded before my eyes. A group of men, their faces hidden by shadows and grime, were gathered around a campfire. They were hunched over a figure, a human figure, their movements frenzied, their grunts animalistic. The firelight flickered on their faces, revealing expressions of savage glee. I raised my camera, my hands shaking, and snapped a few pictures. The flash startled them, their heads snapping up, their eyes glinting in the firelight. They saw me, their expressions shifting from glee to rage. I turned and ran, my lungs burning, my legs pumping. I could hear them crashing through the underbrush behind me, their curses and threats echoing through the night. I stumbled and fell, my camera clattering to the ground. I scrambled to my feet, my heart pounding like a drum. I ran until I couldn't run anymore until my legs gave out and I collapsed on the forest floor. I lay there, gasping for breath, listening to the sounds of the night. The silence was deafening. They were gone. I made my way back to my car, my body bruised and battered, my mind reeling. I drove through the night. The images of that clearing seared into my brain. When I got back to the city, I went straight to my editor. I showed him the pictures, told him what I'd seen. He was skeptical at first, but the look in my eyes, the tremor in my voice, convinced him. The story was published, a chilling account of my encounter with the mountain men. It caused a sensation, a wave of fear and fascination. The authorities launched an investigation, but the mountain men had vanished, leaving no trace. The story faded from the headlines, but it never faded from my memory. I still dream of that night, of the scream, of the firelight flickering on those savage faces. In the aftermath, the case of the missing hikers remained unsolved, a dark stain on the otherwise pristine beauty of the Appalachians. The mountain men, if that's who they were, were never found. Some say they were just a myth, a local legend to scare children. Others say they were real, a relic of a bygone era a dark secret hidden in the heart of the mountains. I know what I saw. The experience changed me, hardened me. It taught me that evil exists in this world, that there are dark. It taught me that sometimes the most terrifying monsters are not the ones in fairy tales, but the ones who walk among us, hidden in plain sight.
This happened to me in 94. My name is Adam Dominguez, and I am 33 years old, and I'm no stranger to the backcountry. Born and bred in Montana, I've spent more time in the wilderness than most folks spend in their own living rooms. But what I witnessed that summer in Yellowstone National Park wasn't just another bear encounter or a close call with a bison. I'd been working as a park ranger for five years, loved the quiet solitude of the off-season. Fewer tourists, more wildlife. That morning started like any other, the sun just cresting over the Absaroka Range, casting long shadows on the frost-covered meadows. A cup of black coffee steaming in my hand, I sat on the porch of the ranger station, soaking in the stillness before the day's duties began. The radio crackled to life. Harwell, you got a call from a hiker on the Hell Roaring Trail. Claims he saw something strange. Strange in Yellowstone usually met a grizzly sow protecting her cubs, or maybe an elk entangled in barbed wire. I grabbed my gear, hopped in my truck, and headed towards the trailhead. The Hell Roaring Trail was a favorite amongst experienced hikers a steep climb through pine forests and alpine meadows, offering breathtaking views of the Yellowstone River. As I drove, I replayed the hiker's panicked call in my head. He mentioned a creature, something not right, moving too fast. I scoffed, figuring it was probably a case of overactive imagination mixed with the thin mountain air. I reached the trailhead and found the hiker, a middle-aged man named Robert, shaking like a leaf. He spoke between gasps. Harwell. You gotta believe me. I was about a mile up when I saw it. Huge, like a man, but hairy, hunched over. It moved like nothing I've ever seen darting between the trees. I tried to calm him down, offering him water and a granola bar. Mr. Robert, it's probably a bear. They can move surprisingly fast when they want to. He shook his head vehemently. No, this wasn't a bear. It had long arms, almost dragging on the ground, and its eyes. They glowed even in the daylight. Against my better judgment, I agreed to hike up the trail with him. I figured I'd show him some bear tracks, maybe some scat, and ease his mind. But as we climbed higher, a sense of unease settled over me. The forest was unnaturally quiet, the usual chatter of birds and squirrels absent. We reached the spot where Robert claimed to have seen the creature. There were no tracks, no scat, no sign of any animal, just a patch of disturbed earth and a broken branch. I started to dismiss Robert's claims when a movement caught my eye. A figure, tall and hunched, emerged from the trees. It moved with an unnatural fluidity, its limbs contorting in ways that defied anatomy. Its skin was a mottled patchwork of fur and scales, its eyes reflecting the sunlight with an eerie luminescence. It wasn't a bear, nor was it human. It was something else entirely. A primal fear gripped me a feeling I hadn't experienced since I was a child. I reached for my radio, but the creature lunged. It grabbed Robert, its elongated claws piercing his flesh. Robert screamed, a sound that echoed through the stillness of the forest. The creature lifted Robert off the ground, its grotesque face inches from his. I could see the terror in Robert's eyes as the creature opened its mouth, revealing rows of jagged teeth. It bit into Robert's neck, tearing through flesh and bone. I stumbled backward, the radio slipping from my grasp. The creature turned its glowing eyes towards me, its mouth dripping with blood. It let out a guttural growl, a sound that chilled me to the bone. I turned and ran, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't look back, but I could hear the creature's heavy footsteps behind me. It was gaining on me. I stumbled and fell, the forest floor scraping my skin. I scrambled to my feet, my lungs burning. I could hear the creature's ragged breathing, feel its hot breath on my neck. I made it to the edge of a cliff, the Yellowstone River raging below. The creature was right behind me. I had nowhere else to go. I closed my eyes, bracing for the impact, but it never came. I opened my eyes, expecting to see the creature looming over me, but it was gone. I was alone. I stumbled back to the ranger station, my clothes torn, my body bruised. I radioed for help, my voice shaking. When the other rangers arrived, they found me babbling incoherently, my eyes wide with terror. They searched the trail, but found no trace of Robert or the creature. They chalked it up to shock, the trauma of a bear attack. But I knew the truth. 
I had seen it with my own eyes. In the aftermath, I was placed on leave. My colleagues whispered behind my back, casting doubt on my sanity. I couldn't blame them. What I had seen defied explanation. But I knew what I saw, and I knew I wasn't the only one who had seen it. There were whispers amongst the old-timers in the park, stories passed down through generations of a creature lurking in the shadows, preying on those who dared to venture too far into the wilderness. I never went back to Yellowstone. I left Montana trying to put the incident behind me. But I couldn't escape the nightmares, the chilling memory of the creature's glowing eyes. I still wonder about the creature. What was it? Where did it come from? And why did it choose to reveal itself to me? These questions haunt me, gnawing at my sanity. I've tried to tell my story, but no one believes me. They think I'm crazy, a victim of my own imagination. But I know the truth. The creature is out there, somewhere in the vast wilderness. And it's waiting. What I know about the creature is that it is a being of pure instinct and hunger. It is driven by a primal need to feed, to consume, to survive. It hunts not out of malice, but out of necessity. It is a predator, and we are its prey. I'm an avid outdoorsman, so when my buddies, Jermaine and Kellen, invited me to join their backpacking trip to the Redwood National Park in California, it took me about a nanosecond to say yes. Anyone who's a true outdoors enthusiast knows how those redwoods just make you feel, right? They just exude this vibe that's all primeval and awe-inspiring. I mean, come on, the tallest trees on the planet, I'm usually the practical one in our little group, always with my compass, my fully packed first aid kit, the offline maps, you name it, I got it. But that trip? Man, I don't know what got into me. I left half my stuff behind, even my satellite phone. Maybe I was just too excited being back in the wild or something. So yeah, we hike in, set up our campsite, that whole good old nature routine. By day three, we decide to push a bit deeper, check out a trail had Jermaine stumbled across online. It's supposed to loop us back to a different part of Campon, like half the time. Red flag number one, but did I mention I was feeling kind of reckless? We figure, hey, what's the worst that can happen? Well, worst case scenario, we get lost. Those woods are a labyrinth. Even with the trail marked, we're turning circles by noon. Kellen, ever Mr. Optimism, swears he remembers this huge fallen redwood from the photos on the trail guide, tells us to hang tight while he scouts ahead. He vanishes into the greenery, leaving Jermaine and me to make the best of it. Now my buddy Jermaine's a good guy, but he's a city slicker at heart. The dude loses his mind if the Wi-Fi signal dips below optimal. Being out here in the Booness and cell service, let's just say I was on entertainment duty. Did the world's worst grizzly bear impression, told some cheesy spooky campfire stories the works. It was more for my own benefit than his, honestly. That gnawing feeling in my gut was getting worse. Time creeps by. No, Kellen. Sun's dipping low. Jermaine starts freaking, asking if I hear that. Hear what? The crickets? The rustling of leaves? That's normal, right? Dude's practically hyperventilating now. Finally, just when I'm about to tell him he needs to man up, I hear it too. It's not an animal. Animals, you can kind of pinpoint, right? This sound is everywhere, like a whispering rustling, but amplified. Closing in on us from all angles, it triggers something primal in me. That fight or flight then kicks in hard. Jermaine, we gotta move. I ditch my pack and grab his arm, pulling him in a random direction. We're crashing through the woods, branches whipping us, feet scrambling on uneven ground. Behind us, the rustling gets louder. It's not just trees anymore. Now there are clicking sounds, these deep chitters that make my skin crawl. We stumble out onto a dirt road. We look at each other, both of us panting, covered in leaves and scratches. My relief at being out of those trees lasts about two seconds before my brain catches up with my body. Because something isn't right. This road, it's not on any of our maps. It's also freakishly well-maintained for being out in the middle of nowhere. There's, there's a smell too. Kind of like rotting neat tinge with something sickly sweet. Whatever those things in the woods were, I get the feeling they're not far behind. We start hauling down the road. Jermaine still yammering about how we're dead. 
We should go back, blah, blah. I'm about ready to clock him just to make him shut up when I see it up ahead, like in the middle of the road. It's hard to make out at first, all shadowy and hulking in the fading light. As we get closer, the details hit me like a ton of bricks. First, the size. It's huge, easily blocking off the entire road. Then the shape, bipedal, but way too lanky, with these disproportionately long arms almost dragging on the ground. Oh, and did I mention the head? Too big, too elongated, and definitely not human. It has no hair, just this weird, leathery-looking gray skin. The thing, creature, whatever it is, twitches. Its massive head starts rotating our way as we finally freeze. Its nostrils. These giant, gaping holes start flaring like it's sensing the air. And that's when I see the eyes. They're too wide-set, too sunken, and shine with this reflective, inhuman yellow gleam as they fix on us. Germain makes this whimpering noise beside me. Now it's like a switch flipped in my brain. I get tunnel vision, all my attention focused on this. Abomination in front of us. The rustling from the woods is almost on top of us. I figure whatever those things are, they're worse than this roadblock. Survival mode all the way. Germain, snap out of it, I yell. Grab a rock, big one, aim for the head. He just stares at me, eyes wide. I grab the biggest rock I can find and heave it at the creature. It hits true right on the side of its head, makes a sickening, cracking sound, and this weird green ooze starts dripping down. It lets out a screeching roar that makes my ears ring, and suddenly it's on its feet, towering above us. I grab another rock, but before I can throw, the woods behind us erupt with movement. The first thing to break through the forest is a scream, piercing and guttural. I don't know if it's human or animal or something else. Whatever it is, it sends a shiver down my spine. Then there are forms crashing through the undergrowth, dozens of them. They're smaller than the roadblock monster, but just as fast. Hairless, hunched, they look like a cross between oversized monkeys and those creepy deep-sea fish with the huge mouths and beady eyes. Germain screaming now, a high-pitched panic sound that cuts right through my own fear. The smaller creatures swarmed towards us, their razor-sharp teeth bared. The rocks, I shout, remembering our last desperate line of defense. We grab stones and start fighting like rabid dogs. The creatures are surprisingly strong. I smash one in the face, feeling bones splintering under the impact. It screeches and staggers back, giving me a moment to scan the chaos. There's too many of them, way too many. We're not going to last long like this. Outnumbered. I fall back a few steps, eyes darting for any sign of our escape route. Then I see it. The roadblock creature is distracted by a cluster of the monkey things tearing at its legs. Behind it, the road curves into a sharp blind turn. My brain starts firing again, pushing past the animalistic fear. We have to run for it. Germain, I yell over the shrieks and growls. I point at the turn. We go for it. Now. He nods, eyes wide and wild. It's now or never. We bolt, dadging and weaving through the swarm. Stones fly past us, flung by those freakish little hands. I feel a sharp sting on my cheek, a hot trickle of blood. The monster finally notices us, letting out an enraged bellow. It charges, brushing smaller creatures aside like ragdolls. Every muscle in my body burns as we sprint towards the turn. We're almost there. My fingers practically grazing the rough asphalt. Germain's a step behind me, his labored breathing loud in my ears. I can feel the monster's hot, fetid breath on the back of my neck. And then Germain trips. He stumbles, arms flailing, falling flat on his face. My heart drops. No time, no time. Get up, I shout, skidding to a stop, nearly crashing into him. But it's too late. The creature is already upon us, a monster silhouette bathed in the bloody glow of the sunset. I close my eyes, bracing myself for the impact which never comes. I open my eyes to a scene of carnage. The monster is on the ground, thrashing weakly. Its once gray skin now streaked a sickening shade of yellow. The smaller creatures are scattered, some lying still, others shrieking as they retreat back into the darkness of the woods. Standing over the monster is Kellen, holding what looks like a tree branch, except it's dripping with the same green ooze that was leaking from the big one's head. Nice stick, Kellen, I gasp, still trying to wrap my mind around what just happened. Kellen gives a sheepish grin. Found it snagged on a bush. 
Lucky break, huh? We approached cautiously. Closer up, it's clear that whatever Kellen used, it pierced straight through the thing's skull. That, that wasn't a branch. Germain stutters from beside me, voice trembling. Kellen shrugs. Whatever, man. This whole place, it ain't right. We gotta get out of here. We don't argue with that. Germain is in shock, still covered in scratches and spattered with blood. I'm running on pure adrenaline. And Kellen, well, I've never seen him so grim-faced. We stumble down that road, leaving the freakish carcass behind us. It's a long time before any of us speak. As we walk, we find signs of civilization, discarded cans, candy wrappers, the garbage of some secret community. Finally, we reach the main highway. Hitching a ride is easy enough. Who wouldn't pick up three guys that looked like we just fought our way through hell? At the next town, we find a ranger station, our story spilling out in a panic jumble of words. We tell them everything, the road, the creatures, the whole nine yards. And you know what? They believe us. They find the road. They find the bodies. And yeah, they don't find any trace of what exactly those things were. But the locals, they whisper stories that sound a lot like ours. Stories about other disappearances, other sightings, all hushed up and swept under the rug. Some even swear those trees themselves, those mighty redwoods, have a malevolent streak, a hunger. We never go back to Redwood Park. We barely talk about what happened. Sometimes, when I'm out hiking or enjoying the solitude of nature, I feel a tremor run through me. Did anyone believe the locals' old tales? Were we lucky, or just not chosen this time? I don't know. All I know is that out there, under those ancient trees, something lurks and waits and watches. And it's not friendly. I'm Caden. And yeah, maybe my whole RV life and travel the country thing seems a bit cliche at this point. But hey, when you sell your business at 33 for way more money than you'd ever dreamed, Cliché starts looking pretty damn appealing. Besides, it's not like I sit around in my aluminum box making friendship bracelets. I freelance, keep myself busy. This May, I'm in Olympic National Park, not the beachy part, the rainforest. L, I found this wicked boondocking spot down some crazy logging road miles from anyone tucked beside a rushing little river. It's exactly the kind of place that makes city folks nervous and people like me. Well, let's just say happy. Rain drizzled this morning like it does here, and now the sun's peeking through the clouds lighting up the moss like it's neon. I was working, minding my own, when a thud hit my RV. Hard, like someone throwing a rock. Now there ain't nobody out here. I poked my head out, looking around, expecting to see, I don't know, a squirrel with something against RVs? Nothing. That's when the scratching started, low against the metal like something dragging long claws along the side. I peered out the window, half expecting a bear on a sugar high, but I didn't see anything. The sound moved up, scratching at the roof now. Definitely not a bird-sized critter, that's for sure. I grabbed my bear spray, the kind that could stop a grizzly in its tracks, but held back on opening the door. Whatever it was, it sounded big. Too big and fast for me to be comfortable taking it on blind. Finally it stopped. Silence settled over the clearing. So thick the buzzing in my ears became all I could hear. I waited a good twenty minutes. And when nothing else happened, well, I figured whatever it was had moved on. And yeah, I should have left right then. That would have been the smart play. But here's the thing, folks. There's smart. And then there's curious. Guess which one usually wins out in my book. I opened the door, taking a step out and scanning the tree line. Dense forest stared back leaves dripping with the damp. Nothing moved, but I knew better than to let the silence fool me. I took another step, heading for the side of my RV where the scratching was loudest. It had left marks, that was for sure, long gashes in the paint. But there were no footprints, no fur, or anything I could use to identify what I was dealing with. That's when I saw the blood, right on the edge of a nasty scratch, a smear of red, not animal blood, I don't think. That color was too dark, and I didn't smell the iron tang. Someone had been out here, or rather something. Adrenaline kicked in, sharpening my vision. I followed the blood trail, and it led me into the woods, not far, just to the edge of the tree line. And there, 
caught on a snag, was a tuft of cloth, blue flannel, torn, as if something with claws had ripped through it. My fingers brushed it, and the coarse weave felt familiar. It was the same pattern as a flannel I'd seen a couple weeks back in the little town where I'd stocked up on supplies. A lumberjack type had been wearing it. A big fella with a beard. One of those quiet mountain man types. I shoved the fear down. Okay, so maybe something got to the lumberjack before that scratching sound came from my RV. But I'm armed. I'm cautious. And whoever was hurt couldn't be far off. I might be able to help. I followed the trail deeper. The flannel scraps and bloodstains a grim path into the green maze. Then the trees opened up a little, and that's when I saw the shack. Now, I don't mean cabin, not some cute little thing. This was rough. Walls slapped together from unpainted boards half hidden under mossy vines. Coil of smoke spiraled from a crooked chimney. It sat in a clearing littered with rusting tools, gnawed bones, and more scraps of that blue flannel. My skin prickled. This was no hunter's hideaway. No abandoned forest shack. This place reeked of something wrong. And as I stood there debating whether to run like hell or play the hero, a voice rasped from inside the shack. The voice was dry, like it hadn't been used in ages, and pitched too low to be fully human. My body decided for me. I turned and bolted, the woods a blur around me. I didn't stop until my RV came into sight, the familiar shape promising some sliver of safety. I slammed inside, locking the door behind me. My heart jackhammered in my chest and I knew I couldn't stay. I had to get the hell out of here. Drive till I found cell service report everything. But as I went to start the engine, a sound echoed outside. That scraping, dragging noise against the roof. I crept to the window, peeking out. There it was. Crouched on my rig was no bear, no cougar, nothing I could name. Its skin was pale gray, stretched tight over two sharp bones. Its limbs were too long, ending in hands that were more like claws. But its head, its head was a grotesque, misshapen echo of a human skull the eyes sunken and glowing with an eerie light. I don't know what I saw that day, but I don't think it ever truly was human. It turned its head towards me, and a grin stretched across its deformed face. That's when I saw the blood staining its teeth, and the strip of blue flannel hanging from its maw. The creature crouched outside, its claws tapping rhythmically against the roof. It wasn't going anywhere. I looked around the RV, frantic for something I could use. My gaze fell on the bear spray, useless against whatever that was, and my hunting knife, good for prepping food, not so much against a nightmare beast. There was no winning a fight like this, not trapped in here. I had to get out, find some sort of cover. I couldn't go out the door. It was watching. But there was the roof hatch, the one I used to clean solar panels. I swung it open, trying to make as little noise as possible and my head hit fresh air. I was up before I knew it, scrambling onto the roof of my RV. My heartbeat thrashed in my ears, making it hard to hear the thing's movements. I glanced down. It was still there. Crouched by the driver's door, those sunken eyes locked on me. I wanted to scream, to break the unnatural stillness, but I knew noise would only draw it in. I had to reach the tree line. If it followed me, I might have a chance among the tangled growth, a shot at losing it. Taking a deep breath, I jumped. I hit the ground harder than I expected, the impact jarring my knees. The creature instantly reacted, scrambling off the RV and onto the ground with an awful clicking noise. That's when I saw its feet. Hooves. Cloven hooves. My brain stumbled over the sight. It couldn't be real. Yet there it was, unnatural, impossible, and terrifyingly fast as it charged straight for me. I took off running, the woods a blur before me. I risked a glance back and regretted it. The thing was gaining, its distorted limbs propelling it forward in loping strides like some unholy goat-demon hybrid. A root snagged my foot, pitching me forward. The world spun, and I slammed into the ground. The impact knocked the breath from me. Gasping, I tried to shove myself up, but before I could, it was on me. It came from above, dropping onto my back with a grunt that was shockingly human for how inhuman the creature looked. Claws gouged my shoulders as it raked them. I let out a yell, pure pain and terror, and thrashed wildly. 
I must have flipped us because suddenly we were rolling, me flailing, and the beast screeching, a high-pitched squealing. Through the struggle, my hand caught on something, a broken branch, jutting from the ground. Without thinking, I grabbed it and rammed the jagged end upwards. The creature shrieked in agony, its weight shifting off me. I scrambled away, a sob tearing out of my throat. I didn't look back, just ran, branches tearing at my face, the creature's pained, screeching, fading behind me. I ran until my lungs burned and even the fear couldn't force my feet to keep moving. Collapsing behind a mossy tree trunk, I gasped for breath, my whole body trembling. I was alone. The woods were silent. I sat there, huddled for what felt like hours. The shock kept the full force of what had happened at bay. Had I stabbed the… the thing? Had I killed it? And if not, where was it now? The sun was setting by the time I pulled myself together enough to move. With numb legs and a mind buzzing with adrenaline and terror, I stumbled back in the direction of my RV. I found it half destroyed. The creature had torn off a door, ripped open a tire, and left claw marks gashed deep into the metal. It was still waiting for me. This time it didn't charge. It crouched near the tree line, watching. And in the last light of the day, I saw more clearly the thing protruding from its misshapen chest. The wooden stake I had shoved through its body, it wasn't going to follow me. I turned and walked away, leaving the RV and the nightmare behind. I don't know how I made it out of the woods, how I found the highway, how I flagged down a car. The people who stopped were kind, shocked by my disheveled state, but quick to offer help. A phone, a ride back to civilization. The police searched the woods. They didn't find any sign of the creature or a lumberjack, but they did find my RV a few days later. They didn't believe my story, of course. Wild animal attack, they said. Maybe a crazed hermit in the woods. That's easier to swallow than whatever I saw out there. People tell me I should sell the RV, give up this life, that I'm lucky to be alive. Maybe they're right, but there's this voice in my head, a whisper, telling me it ain't over. The locals in the towns around Olympic, they talk about old stories, something lurking in the woods. They call it the skin taker. Makes me wonder, was this the first time? Or did it have that lumberjack skin before, and now it has mine? My name is Wood O'Tooley, and this happened to me on July 12, 2009. Back then, I was just a small-town cop in Cedar Creek, Nevada. A speck on the map, kind of town where the biggest excitement was usually Mrs. Henderson's cat getting stuck up a tree again. That afternoon started like any other. I was at the station finishing a lukewarm coffee and a stale donut when the call came in. A hiker had stumbled across something strange out in the desert, something he couldn't quite explain. Dispatch figured it was just a coyote carcass or some desert junk but they needed someone to check it out. So I grabbed my hat and headed out. Cedar Creek was surrounded by miles of unforgiving desert. The sun beat down like a hammer, baking the sand and scrub brushed to a crisp. I drove out on the dusty road, following the coordinates dispatch had given me. The hiker, a skinny guy named Ethan, was waiting by the side of the road, looking a bit shaken. Officer Tolley, he asked, wiping sweat from his forehead. That's me, I said, getting out of the car. You the one who called it in? He nodded, leading me down a rocky path. I was just out for a hike, you know, trying to get some exercise when I saw it. Over there. He pointed to a shallow ravine. There, lying in the dirt, was a body. It was badly decomposed, picked clean by the desert scavengers. Couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman. But there was one thing that made my blood run cold the way the limbs were twisted like a broken doll. Jesus, I muttered, pulling out my notebook. You touch anything? Ethan shook his head, just called it and right away. I started taking notes, documenting the scene as best I could. No idea on the body, no obvious signs of foul play. Just a dead body in the middle of nowhere. I radioed it in, and soon the forensics team arrived, along with Sheriff Mallory. Another one? Mallory sighed, looking down at the body. Another one? I asked. He nodded grimly. This is the third one this month, all found out here in the desert, all in the same condition. Any connection between them? 
Mallory shook his head. No IDs, no missing person reports. It's like they just appeared out of thin air. We spent hours combing the area, but found nothing. No footprints, no tire tracks, no sign of a struggle. It was like the body had simply materialized in the desert. As the sun began to set, casting long shadows across the sand, a chill ran down my spine. This was more than just a dead body. This was something sinister, something that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. The next few days were a blur of investigations and dead ends. We put out a description of the body, hoping someone might recognize it, but nothing came back. The other two bodies were still unidentified, and the whole town was starting to get spooked. Then, a week later, another call came in. Another hiker, another body in the desert. This time, it was a young woman, her face frozen in a silent scream. I was starting to lose sleep. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was hunting us, picking us off one by one. I started carrying my gun everywhere I went, even to the diner for coffee. One night I was driving home after a late shift, when I saw something move in the darkness. It was large, hunched over, and moving with an unnatural gait. I slammed on the brakes, my heart pounding in my chest. I reached for my gun, but whatever it was had vanished into the shadows. I knew I should have called it in, but something held me back. I didn't want to sound like a crazy person, seeing things in the desert. But I knew what I saw, and it wasn't human. The next day I went back to the spot where I saw the creature. There in the sand were tracks. Not human tracks, but something with long, clawed toes. I followed the tracks for hours, deeper and deeper into the desert. They led me to a hidden cave, tucked away in a rocky outcrop. I hesitated for a moment, then drew my gun and entered. The cave was dark and damp, the air thick with a strange, musky scent. I moved slowly, my senses on high alert. Then I saw it. It was huddled in the back of the cave, a grotesque, hulking figure with leathery skin and long, sharp claws. Its eyes gleamed in the darkness, and its mouth was open in a silent snarl, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth. I raised my gun, but before I could fire, it lunged. We fought in the darkness, a desperate struggle for survival. Its claws ripped through my clothes, leaving deep gashes on my skin. I fired my gun, but the bullet seemed to have little effect. Just when I thought it was over, I managed to get my hands around its throat. I squeezed with all my strength, feeling its hot, fetid breath on my face. It let out a gurgling sound and collapsed to the ground. I stumbled out of the cave, gasping for air and covered in blood. I radioed for backup, and soon the cave was swarming with cops and paramedics. The creature was dead its body lying twisted and broken on the cave floor. We never figured out what it was, where it came from, or why it was killing people. But one thing was for sure. The killing stopped. As I stood there, watching them haul the creature away, I couldn't help but think about the victims, the lives cut short by this unknown horror. And I thought about the name that came to me in the darkness of that cave, the name that seemed to fit the creature perfectly, the Gorgon. This happened to me on July 9th, 2008. We were in the Adirondacks, New York. Those mountains are a kind of wild that city folks like me rarely see. I'm an electrician by trade, name's Dalton, Dalton Hayes. But that weekend it was all about getting away for the holiday, a rented cabin, some beers, and my friend Ezra since high school. The place was basic, tucked deep in the woods, right by a lake. Only way in was a rough dirt track barely fit for Ezra's beat-up pickup. We didn't care, like the isolation. Unloaded our gear, cracked open some drinks, soaking up the quiet. The perfect escape, at least we thought. That first night is when the atmosphere changed. A scratching sound at the window. Probably just a raccoon looking for scraps, we figured. But then came a thump against the back door that set us both on edge. Wrote it off as a fallen branch, though it sounded too heavy for that. Ezra joked maybe we had a Bigfoot fan out there trying to get our attention. We laughed it off, poured a couple more drinks to calm our nerves. Next morning, the mood got darker. I awoke with this feeling of eyes on me. Ezra swore he hadn't heard anything, hadn't slept well either, just blamed the cheap whiskey. 
checked outside, found a deep gouge in the cabin wall, and a half-eaten rabbit carcass a few yards away. We tried to dismiss it, maybe a bear, but something felt wrong. We spent the day swimming in the lake, keeping a half-hearted eye out for trouble. By evening, the tension was thick enough to choke on. The only good part was that beautiful sunset over the lake, all fiery orange and red. But when the last of the light faded, that's when things escalated. The snarling started low, a primal, guttural noise that didn't sound like any animal I knew. Then the thudding began, rhythmic blows against the walls, the door, like whatever was out there was testing the cabin's defenses. We peered out through gaps in the curtains, trying to see what we were up against. Couldn't make out much, just a vague outline of a huge, bulky figure, and the moonlight glinting off what I can only describe as claws. Ezra cursed, fumbled in his bag, and came up with his father's old hunting rifle. I had zero experience with guns, but at that point, I'd have grabbed anything. We hunkered down as recovering the door, me by the window, both hearts rattling like a box of nails. It was then that I saw it properly, as it lurched past the window under the porch light. Thing was massive, easily seven feet tall, built like a linebacker gone feral. Its thick hide was dark, bristly, and its limbs had an inhuman twist to them. The head, God, that head still haunts me. Muzzle blunt and wide, its eyes shining sickly yellow. It was like a bear mutated into something monstrous. The creature slammed into the door once, twice, splintering the wood. Ezra took a panicked shot through the gaps, the roar of the rifle deafening in the small room. Something howled outside, more pain than rage. We heard it retreating, heavy footsteps crashing through the underbrush and fading into the distance. Silence fell but it wasn't comforting. In the moonlight, we saw the blood staining the porch. We'd wounded it and raged it. Our cabin now felt more like a flimsy trap than a safe haven. Ezra looked at me, determination battling fear in his eyes. We're leaving, he gritted out. At dawn, we run for the truck. It's our only chance. Sleep was impossible. Every creak, every rustle of leaves had us on our feet, rifles shaking in my sweaty hands. As the first pale light broke, we made a break for it. Each step was agony, expecting our attacker to pounce from the trees. We sprinted for the truck, fumbling with the keys. The engine roared to life. I thought we had it, a mad, desperate hope flaring up. Just as we pulled out onto the track, we heard it, a final, enraged bellow from the woods. Then it was there, bursting from the tree line. For a terrifying second, its massive form filled my vision. Ezra slammed on the gas, the truck fishtailed, kicking up dust and gravel. In the rearview mirror, I saw it charging after us, a blur of fury and claws. We hit the main road just as it reached the edge of the forest. It stood there for a moment, silhouetted against the trees, then turned with unnatural speed and disappeared back into its domain. We didn't stop driving until we were miles away. Both of us shaking, barely able to speak. Back in town, we told the cops some vague story about a bear attack. They were dubious, but what else could we do? Nobody would believe the truth about that thing in the woods. Ezra swore he'd never return to the Adirondacks, sold off his father's rifle, drank himself stupid for weeks after. I didn't blame him. Some experiences. They etch themselves into your very soul. It's been years now, but the memory of that weekend lingers like a cold shadow. I haven't been back to a remote cabin since. City lights and noise suit me just fine these days. And every time I read a story about some crazy creature sighting, a flicker of recognition runs through me. Because I know, deep down, that there are things in the wild places. Things the world hasn't yet named. And God help you if they decide to name you instead. Last year, me and my buddy Caleb were knocking around the country for a while. You know those aimless road trips after college? Where you just pile all your camping gear into the back of a beat-up SUV and try your luck on the open road? It was kind of like that, only there hadn't been any college for either of us. See, Caleb grew up on his family farm in the middle of nowhere, Iowa and me. Don't ask where I'm from originally. That's another story. Anyway, we found odd jobs through summer then headed down south by the time the leaves started turning. 
This particular stretch of road was in New Mexico high desert scrub, red dust swirling around and mountains that didn't get close enough to touch. We'd been heading to check out some national park, but Caleb, always in tune with the spiritual side of things, saw a weathered signpost for Masonic Springs, a dirt road detour into what looked like absolute nothingness. He grinned and swerved onto it, and I let him, half asleep in the passenger seat. About an hour jolting along that dirt track, I started seeing things. Not mirages, buildings, kind of. Squat, weathered adobe structures half sunken into the landscape. Whoa, whoa, stop, I said. And Caleb pulled over, that same knowing look on his face. We got out of the truck. The sun was dipping lower, and it was already that eerie desert quiet, like the world held its breath. We wandered over to the nearest of those half-ruins. I touched crumbling sun-baked walls, ran my finger over rough hand-carved symbols, and looked inside what must have been a doorway. It was dark in there, and it smelled odd, like wet fur in something old. I shivered. Come on, Evren, Caleb coaxed, and like an idiot I followed him inside. That was where it started going wrong. Something moved in the deeper shadows fast, faster than anything human. And just before the sun vanished entirely, I caught a glimpse of two eyes glowing faintly, not yellow, but a sort of dull orange. We should have run right then, but you know how it goes in these situations. We stood frozen for what felt like a lifetime. Caleb swore low. What the hell is that thing? It stepped closer, a hulking shape like a man, but hunched, furred, with a muzzle too long for any dog I knew. I could smell it clearer now, like moldy meat with a tinge of something burnt. It lunged, making a sound that was almost a growl, but not quite. I screamed, Caleb yelled, and we bolted. We scrambled through the ruined building, out into the dusk. The thing was close behind, its breathing ragged and harsh, those paws hitting the dirt with a dull thudding sound. Caleb was shouting, Evren, faster, this way, I think I saw something. He veered to the right, and I trusted him, ran as if my life depended on it, which it did. I had a quick glimpse of a low cave entrance half concealed by a tumble of rocks, didn't think, just dived in, scrabbling on my hands and knees over the gritty floor. Behind me I heard Caleb swear, and then a wet thump followed by a shriek that cut off way too soon. I kept crawling, even as tears streaked down my face. I couldn't go back. That thing was… was… a hand grabbed my ankle, rough and powerful. I kicked wildly, sobbing, and then managed to twist squeezing through a crevice just as a clawed paw swiped down where my leg had been seconds before I didn't stop scrambling until I felt a crack beneath me, and I was tumbling out of the far side of the cave's opening landing in a tangle of prickly bushes and dust. I didn't see or hear the thing pursue me. Maybe it couldn't fit out the crevice. Maybe it had found something else. I scrambled to my feet, ran on blind instinct towards where Caleb's truck should be. I found it by moonlight somehow got in, hands shaking too bad to put the keys in the ignition, but finally roaring off down the dirt track, back towards the highway. And then, well, I guess I kept driving. Still do sometimes. Can't stay in one place for too long. Don't much like the dark, either. The first rays of dawn found me sprawled on the roadside, probably twenty miles from where Caleb's truck had broken down at last. I was covered in dust, shaking, maybe in shock. But the memory, that orange-eyed thing, the unnatural howl that was not Caleb, kept me moving. Flagged down a trucker, told some blurry half-truth about a wrecked car, and he got me as far as the next town. From there? Well, it's like they say. Some folks survive stuff like that, carry on. Not the same as before, but they make it work. I found a cash-in-hand job at a diner in that town. Kept my head down. At night, though, I'd lie awake in my rented room with the shades drawn, and I'd see it. That slick fur, the twitching muzzle, those damn eyes. Six months passed like that. Then one afternoon a stranger walked into the diner. Tall guy, weathered face, quiet intensity about him. He ordered coffee, settled into a booth, and I swear his eyes locked with mine for a beat too long. Turns out his name was Elias, and he was a hunter. Not that normal outdoorsman kind, but, well, the other kind. The kind that townsfolk only whisper about. He didn't beat around the bush. 
I reckon I know what you saw out there, he said, his voice low and rumbling. Folks call them different names, but where you been, there's an old word for it. Skinwalker. He went on, explained it calmly, like we were discussing the weather. Skinwalkers. They ain't just stories to scare kids. They're real, and they're out there. Elias had some theories. Twisted people, making themselves into something not human, not animal. He had ways to track them. Weapons, knowledge, and most importantly, he had a score to settle with these things. He looked right at me, and what he saw must have been someone ready to be broken by guilt and terror. You want to stop those things? Make them pay for what they did? I took a shuddering breath, and, you know, even then I wasn't sure if I'd said yes out loud. But he saw it in my eyes. Next couple of years, that's another story entirely. How to set a trap, and yeah, how to face down those things in the dark, when the normal rules of the world don't apply anymore. It wasn't easy. One time in the Arizona desert, we cornered one. I never want to smell that wet fur and burning scent again, or hear those growls. But we got it. And another a few months later in the deep woods of Washington State. Each time Elias swore it would be the last one. But we both knew it wasn't true. There's always more out there in the shadows. So yeah, I still hit the road sometimes. I got an old camper van now, and I keep a shotgun under the mattress. I check out small towns, the lonely places. And if I hear talk about people vanishing strange tracks, a lurking fear folks can't quite name, well, I stick around, keep my ears open. I figure it's the least I owe to Caleb to all the others. It's my redemption or maybe my punishment, but it's mine. And if I'm being really honest, there's something else too. We took down a few, but I know there's more of those skinwalkers lurking out there with their orange eyes, their hunger for things they shouldn't be hungry for. And deep down, there's a tiny part of me that's looking for one in particular, the one that started it all back in that New Mexico desert. Someday, maybe I'll find it.